Thank you, Alex, Trey, Gary, James, everyone involved in the NRNB. I want to echo Steve's comment uh, earlier in that yesterday was one of the most fun days I've had the pleasure of spending listening about the, the tremendous work that all of you at the NRNB and in the Cytoscape developers have been doing over the years. It's a real pleasure to see that platform develop. We use it extensively um, and appreciate all the effort that's gone into it. And our folks have been avidly using the beta version of three. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to tell you a story that, that really starts around this question. Um, and it really is going to expand a little bit beyond what, what Alex mentioned. Uh, the question we're really interested in is, is how do interactome networks give us insight in terms of the genotype to phenotype question? And more importantly, how do perturbations of those networks really uh, lead to disease? Uh, this is work that's done by a, a wide, a large number of folks. This is a snapshot of our summer retreat that we hold up in Gloucester. Um, and, and it's, it's my privilege and honor to really tell you about the work of a large number of, of very talented people. The program is headed by Mark Vidal, who's a professor at, in genetics and director of our center. And I've listed a number of the folks over the years who've contributed to this who are currently here. And I want to highlight particularly a number of collaborations, some of which I'll talk about throughout the course of, uh, of the uh, remaining few minutes. And that is uh, Laszlo Barabasi, with whom we've collaborated for a number of years now. Uh, and people in his group, as well as Fritz Roth, uh, who's now at Toronto, and folks in his group. And then some recent collaborations with people like Sue Lindquist, um, Huda Zogby, and uh, a number of others. So the real question is this. How do we get from genotype to phenotype? There is an enormous amount of data that's giving us more and more reference genotypes, as well as alterations in genotypes. But you know, and, and daily, almost weekly, there's new papers identifying candidate disease genes, GWAS studies that are providing enormous amounts of genetic variation, and we're, we're drowning in a sea of data. And Steve already alluded to this. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, that we need to consider a number of other elements when we try and make sense of all of this. And for simple Mendelian diseases, it's complicated by the fact that you have incomplete penetrance, you have pleiotropy, and you have modifier genes, which can turn an otherwise very simple circumstance into one more, compl more complex than we would think. And in complex traits, all bets are off. We really don't yet have uh, enough information to begin to unequivocally identify causality coming out of a lot of the large-scale sequencing. That data is essential, but it's not sufficient. We would argue, and I think here I'm starting to speak, I'm preaching to the choir, that really we'll find the answers to this by investigating the networks in which macromolecules play parts. And in particular, it's the disruption of those networks that is essential for getting from genotype to phenotype, to really understanding causality uh, due to genetic variation. Now, just to back up one minute, I'm not, this is something all of you w are well versed on and, and appreciative of, but I want to define the interactome and what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time is the physical interactions between all possible macromolecules that can occur and our interactome networks as we build them right now are static in that we don't have a temporal or spatial dimension to them, but we have to ultimately consider protein-protein interactions, protein-RNA, RNA-RNA, DNA-protein, and, and metabolites. And the questions we want to ask, thank you. The questions we want to ask are how are interactome networks organized? How does this organization reflect in vivo function? And how are they perturbed or altered in disease states? Now, as I already mentioned, we're looking at biophysical interactions, and most of my talk is going to really be related to protein-protein interactions in these graphs. The nodes would be proteins. A line between any two nodes reflects a biophysical interaction. Uh, but this is insufficient. It's necessary. But we really need functional relationships, and that's the challenge going forward for us in the entire field. Uh, in particular, there's issues of direction, sign, and strength, and you deal with things that, such as activation, repression, and logic gates. Now, Steve already showed a similar slide. There's a number of interactome networks that, that need to be fully integrated to get a really robust picture uh, going forward. 
We are dealing mostly with the protein-protein interaction hairballs, but you can imagine metabolic networks play a key role. Transcriptional regulatory networks are crucial, especially in development. Uh, we, uh, in collaboration with Laszlo Barabasi a number of years ago, looked at gene disease networks in which one gene plays a role in multiple diseases, one disease can be caused by multiple genes, and you can create a bipartite graph to illustrate those um, relationships. And I will spend some time a little bit later talking about virus host networks, uh, as Alex already indicated. So the first question that we faced a number of years ago is how to obtain all the parts. And we set about to do that by taking and creating what we called Orpheum collections. What this is is for a eukaryotic organism with spliced uh, protein coding genes, you use cDNA libraries uh, that have been well characterized, hopefully highly comprehensive, and simply amplify out the protein coding portion, ATG to stop, put it into a universal vector system, in this case gateway, which then we could use to manipulate going forward in a very efficient, high throughput, semi-automated manner, and hopefully at the end of the day get to a comprehensive proteome for expression purposes. Uh, we use gateway, as I mentioned. The advantage there is you do one initial cloning and then through automated processes you can transfer these into a myriad of destination clones. And in this particular case, we're doing protein-protein interaction mapping, so we put them into vectors uh, for expressing protein. Now, the challenge here is, one, getting at least one copy of every reference protein coding gene, so we want Orpheum completeness. But that's really hamstrung even today for virtually all organisms, from yeast to humans, at the level of gene annotation. We simply don't know precise uh, start, start and stop points for all protein coding genes. It's further complicated by the presence of splice isoforms. The few cases we've looked at, we would argue that there's somewhere between five and ten splice isoforms for every protein coding gene in the human genome. And we've already done a few studies where we've found 50 percent more isoforms than one can find in RefSeq, even though the exons for all of those are in exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, and RefSeq databases, the fully assembled, annotated, full-length ORF is not yet. So there's a huge unexplored space there. Domains play a key role in a lot of uh, protein functions, and so one really wants to understand domain architecture. And then lastly, as we're finding with all of the sequencing analysis going on, genetic variation giving rise to alterations in protein coding regions means we need to consider cloning disease alleles. So how do we put all the pieces together once we have comprehensive collections? Our main goal is to basically test in binary fashion all possible combinations for whatever size of collection we have. And for even a small organism such as yeast with 10 to the 3 genes, it's a pretty sizable number of pairwise combinations. There's really only, uh, you know, and, and the challenges are that one has to address questions of transient interactions, low affinity or weak, low abundance proteins. In the system we use, this is not an issue because we express everything at comparable levels, but in other more in vivo systems that becomes a potential problem. <laughs> Transmembrane proteins, as the structural biologists know, are difficult, notoriously difficult, but they're crucial to our understanding. Post-translational modifications can, uh, affect whether or not two proteins could interact or whether, uh, um, or, or enzymatic activity downstream. Disordered regions are now known to play a key role in the number of partners that any given protein can have based on the extent of its own disordered regions or its interacting partners. And then lastly, domains versus full-length proteins. Now there's several systems that allow you to do this. You can either take the approach of looking at binary biophysical protein interactions, and there's the two main screening modalities out there are yeast 2 hybrid, which I'll talk about in a minute, or protein arrays, which are becoming much uh, cheaper nowadays uh, and very effective tools, or protein complex analysis typified by affinity purification mass spectrometry to identify all the proteins that co purify to a certain degree with some target bait. These give you decidedly overlapping and highly complementary data sets, and we really need to do both approaches. They also give you distinctly different networks, although many of the topological properties are similar. And when you integrate these two, you get a much better representation of what's going on. Uh, but 
bear in mind that in this approach we're looking at binary interactions and we can, we can say that any two proteins do physically interact with each other based on, this, on the type of assay we're using, whereas here we simply don't know who's touching whom. Our system uses yeast 2 hybrid. This just recapitulates how that's done. You have a DNA binding, a portion of a, a, portion of a protein that binds DNA, sequence specific DNA binding another protein, a portion of which will activate transcription. You make fusions of X to DB, Y to AD, and if X and Y interact in the, in the context of yeast cells, they turn on a reporter gene and allow selective growth. It's a very simple system. It's been used for many years, uh, and it's very robust and amenable to, uh, to uh, automation and scale-up. Over the years, we've been able to employ this to do a number of interactome maps. Uh, I think certainly all of these figures are cytoscape figures. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and along the way, we've learned a number of lessons about how to make these the most robust maps that we can and how to extract valuable information from them. Part of that comes from a number of really systematic and, and um, uh, defined processes that have helped us move forward. By analogy to the genome sequencing field, which used Cosmins and Bax to really give us the first uh, the, 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 the resources to start sequencing at genome scale. We create Orpheome collections for any organism in which we want to do a yeast 2 hybrid map. Automated sequ sequencers were essential for the genome sequencing project. Similarly, a variety of robotics tools are crucial for us to do the millions of binary combinations that we need to do. The implementation initially of fluorescent sequencing and then Later on, next-gen sequencing has driven genome sequencing uh, and to a, to a pace that exceeds Moore's law. Uh, we've now implemented next-gen sequencing in our own yeast 2 hybrid projects, partly as a way to reduce costs dramatically to be able to increase the throughput we need. And then lastly, the FRED score was really an, an, an important contribution in the field of DNA sequencing because it allowed you to establish a quality metric that was essential for being, having confidence that the sequences you were getting really were, were real. We established a number of years ago what we call an empirical framework, and I want to take you through that because it's led us to some interesting insights and ways in which we can begin to compare data sets coming out of uh, different screens or different sources of curated uh, information. All of this is predicated on knowing a search space. And what I show here is three separate search spaces of our human orpheome and the corresponding number of interactions that came out of uh, yeast 2 hybrid mapping within that search space. So in 2005, we looked at 7,000 proteins, which was about one-ninth of the overall search space, and we obtained close to 3,000 binary protein-protein interactions. A year ago, we completed a survey in which we looked at a search space that was almost twice the size, and now about a quarter of the whole search space assuming 20,000 protein coding genes, and that's given rise to 14,000 binary protein-protein interactions obtained in an unbiased uh, manner. We're now moving forward to where we have about 17 to 18,000 ORFs in our freezers, and we can now carry out an 18K by 18K matrix, and that will generate what we call a reference interactome. So the, f the major question here in all of these for the data sets we're generating is one of quality control. And uh, several years ago, we reasoned that we need to, to really understand this, we had four parameters that we had to deal with. Completeness, which refers to the search space. How many of the ORFs do you actually have at your disposal? Detectability, in a given assay, what can you and can you not detect? And some assays are very good at detecting certain kinds of interactions, others are better at, at, at different sorts of interactions, and one needs to understand that for the given assay. And then lastly, how much coverage are you getting of the particular assay? In many cases, this refers to sampling issues. How many times do you have to run the assay to get maximal coverage, knowing that every time you do it, you won't necessarily return 100 percent of the positives that are detectable? And then lastly, specificity. What is your false positive rate? In this case, uh, coverage and detectability here relate to false negative. We implemented a while back a number of alternative assays with the idea that if we took all the results from screening and tested all of those against any one of several assays, that would help us validate the yeast 2 hybrid results. But in doing that, we learned something very interesting in that, first of all, by going through this process, we could potentially estimate the size of the network. And for humans right now, we're estimating that at somewhere between 150,000 to 300,000 binary interactions. 
We certainly now have a better sense of how to finish the job knowing those parameters, but also we have a way in which to generate highly trustable interaction data. Now, what really allowed us to make, what allows me to make that statement is the fact that we realized several years ago that we needed to go to positive reference sets much, much larger than people were typically willing to use. And in this case, we're now using what we call a PRS of nearly 700 binary interactions that have a high degree of literature curated support behind each and every one of them against a random reference set of 700 random pairs out of a possibility of 84 million combinations. It's highly unlikely that this negative control set, random set, there be any positives in there. These are all bona fide positives based on the fact that they have two, three, four, five pieces of evidence in the literature supporting them. Now, just to give you a sense of where we're at, we being the larger community, if we go to all the literature databases out there and extract all the uh, interactions for human proteins and then subtract out the ones we've contributed to the mix, that leaves us with about 70,000 interactions, oops, sorry, and, and, this, and by recurating all of those databases back and asking a very simple question, how many of those 70,000 are really binary? That reduces the number immediately to about 26,000, 27,000. That means the vast majority of the interactions reported in, in, in the databases are coming from co-complex memberships, which is an important piece of information. It's also incredibly valuable data, but we're interested in binary interactions, so we do that filter cut. And then we ask how many of these 26,000 have more than one piece of evidence supporting them, and all of a sudden we're now down to about 7,500 binary interactions with multiple pieces of evidence. We then took that 7,500, we mapped it back to the Orpheome, we took all that we had cloned ORFs for, that gave us a population of, of, of 1,000 ORFs, and uh, we randomly picked about 700 from there as, as sets of PRS. Now this is a snapshot of a first version PRS that really was only 100, but it illustrates the point that we're seeing over and over again. So here's 100 pairs that the worldwide community says are bona fide binary pairs. These are two different yeast 2 hybrid assays, and you can see about 15% detectability of these PRSs. And here's 100 or so random reference sets, and one of the yeast 2 hybrid assays picks up one. The other one picks up none. So what happens if we then employ four other assays and do that same set? Remember, these are all real. This is what yeast 2 hybrid picks up of these bona fide real ones. When we do all those other assays, we get this result, and we're seeing this time and time again. First of all, when you look at all of the assays in their aggregate, only about 50 percent of the pairs in the literature are picked up in the union. No assay overlaps any other one by more than about 50 percent, and most assays have ones that only they pick up and no others pick up. So for example, here, this Lumiere assay has a handful in this region that is not seen by any of the others. Now, there's two pieces of information that come out of this. The first is you can no longer use this assay and say that failure to pick up a yeast 2 hybrid positive by Lumiere means these are false positives. What this really is telling us is that all of these assays have false negative rates in excess of 50 percent. And we're now seeing false negative rates that we would claim are closer to 80 percent. So we, what that tells us is it's at least it's worked for future generations. We're going to need more assays and more better tools to be able to really expand this search space to where we need to be going forward. Now, the way we now employ this is we take our positive reference set, we have our random reference set, and we take our experimental data set, assay one, assay two, and simply compare them against the PRS. And here's the case for our human 2012 interactome data set. PRS scores at about 12 to 15 percent. The human data that we generated in our screen is a comparable uh, amount. The RRS is exceedingly low. And the literature curated pairs with single evidence do not reproduce as well. So what that tells us is we're not saying that these are necessarily wrong. What it tells us is the tools that go out there and do mining to extract information, those of you wanting to use that data need to know very carefully 
what the supporting evidence is for every piece of data in those data sets. What's in the literature is extraordinarily valuable resource, but we need to be very cautious. Caveat emptor, uh, I guess, is the best way to describe it. We now have this data set, which is completely free to the public. It's been available for several months now. It's yet published. We're writing the paper, but you're welcome to download it and start using it uh, for your own purposes. And you can get it at this uh, website. Okay, what do the hairballs look like? This hairball on the left is those literature curated 7,500 pairs. This hairball on the right is our binary interaction data set. There is very little overlap. The overlap is statistically significant. They both have very similar properties. They're scale free. They obey all of these phenomenon, which we're seeing with all interactome maps in all species uh, that we're finding. So it's somewhat of a common feature. But there were a couple of interesting things that came out of this. One was the notion of hubs. All of you are familiar with this. Some proteins in these interactome networks interact with lots of partners, some with very few. Those that interact with lots of partners we call hubs. And this is a distribution of hubs by virtue of function. And you can see that the cancer genes coming out of the literature are hubs. Not surprising. But we asked, well, is this real? in the sense that what if we now layer on this the number of publications supporting these particular disease classes? And this is what you get. Cancer genes are hubs because they're highly studied genes. Not surprising. And there's been an awful lot of analysis by a lot of people on properties of these. And so we wondered, does our bi unbiased network recapitulate this notion that cancer genes are hubs? Gratifyingly, yes. <laughs> So the point is that, that both the unbiased and, in this case, the literature are converging to a similar point. But I think using an unbiased network allows us to explore a little more deeply and perhaps ask questions that the, the literature, with its sociological biases, might give us false uh, uh, insights. OK, this is the merge network. We can obviously begin to go and look at novel interactions involving various disease genes, in this case, MLLT3 to MCM6. Uh, TP53 is gaining more interactors. Uh, MLH1 has a whole slew of new interactors coming out of these unbiased studies. So we think that this is providing valuable information. Now I want to come back to the disease gene network uh, because I want to make one point of that going forward. These are all various diseases clustered. The color is indicate disease type. This is, for example, the cancers. And any two nodes in this network, any two diseases, are connected if they share a gene. So you see a clustering of cancer genes, not surprisingly, but you really see a highly connected network. And so there are going to be cases where unrelated diseases share the same gene. And that became evident in a study that we did with Huda Zogby a number of years ago looking at ataxias. The first observation was that the six or so known ataxin genes involved in sp spinocerebellar ataxias are closely connected, more closely than you would expect by chance. And furthermore, their modifier loci are also more closely connected to each of the professional ataxia genes as well as to each other more closely than you would expect. But in going back and looking at patient records and looking at other proteins in, in the protein interaction networks, we, we discovered that the diseases involved in macular degeneration were very closely linked to those involved in ataxias. Uh, now, this is maybe not totally surprising, but it was a nice re recapitulation of what we'd seen previously with the gene disease network. And for example, this gene here is, plays a role in both diseases. It also connects to other ataxia or other macular degeneration diseases. So we're seeing a high, much higher degree of connectivity than we would have otherwise expected. And so the lessons learned so far are here. I'm not going to belabor the point. Just to remind you that we're really looking at human disease genes connected in the interactome network and now wanting to ask the question, what happens when we perturb that network in various ways? I want to show you one example on splice isoforms, and I put this out as a bit of a challenge for the Cytoscape developers because we're struggling with how to best represent this data. And this is an example of ARNT2. It's the aryl hydrocarbon receptor nuclear translocator 2. It's a partner for several sensor proteins of the BHLH PAS2 family, and it does play a role in certain neuronal diseases, particularly in the regulation of HIF-1-alpha. Uh, There's a number of isoforms. This is our reference ORF. These are cloned isoforms that we've obtained. And here's the spectrum of interactions of the different isoforms. 
you see that several of the isoforms show a high degree of overlap in their interaction partners, but some of them have very unique partners in this assay. So we, one, want to better understand what this means biologically, and also we need tools for demonstrating, for visualizing this so that we, as we go in and look at patient data, for example, if there's mutations in these exons, but this is the operative isoform, one's conclusions about disease risk are going to be very different than if this is the operative isoform where the mutations are taking place. And so going forward, that's a bit of a challenge, making sure that we have comprehensive isoform collections in which to do these studies. Okay, I already mentioned that our biophysical interactions are necessary, they're not sufficient. And so now I want to turn to how do broken pieces really affect performance? And by broken, I'm being rather uh, very broad-minded here. We can break things a number of ways. But in basically what we're talking about is taking the reference network and understanding how the nodes and edges are, are altered as a consequence of uh, perturbation. Now I want to turn, turn briefly to two examples that leads into why we got into viruses in the first place. The first example is dysregulation of MYC is causative for Burkitt's lymphoma. That's been known for many years. Infection by EBV under the appropriate circumstances can give rise to B-cell lymphoma. And so you have viruses and genetic variation converging on a particular disease type, in this case, lymphoma. A number of years ago, Steve and colleagues demonstrated very effectively that RB, mutational inactivation of which is causative for retinoblastoma and osteosarcoma, is also the target of inactivation by the adenovirus E1A protein. Again, suggestive of the fact that you could get to dysregulation by multiple paths, and in this case, it was viral perturbation that was causative, not genetic variation. So we set about to do an experiment that actually led us down several interesting paths with a number of collaborators. In the first case, with Jeff Dangle at UNC and Joe Ecker at the Salk, we started doing a plant interactome network, and Jeff sent Shahid Mukhtar to the lab and looked at plant pathogens and showed that these pathogenic proteins in, in a, uh, a bacterial species and an omycetes uh, that infects um, uh, plants converged onto hubs in the plant immune network. Separately, we looked at uh, DNA tumor viruses, and I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on the latter, but just show you the results from the plant pathogen work. Two different pathogens uh, converge onto many of the same targets. Not, not completely overlapping, those targets themselves lead into a number of plant functions that are crucial for, for uh, surveillance, for immune fun plant immune function, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can see over here that the interactions converge onto, uh, onto discrete sets. And it gave us different insights than, than what we had seen previously looking at these sorts of things individually. In the DNA tumor virus realm, we took a study involving a number of labs in the Boston area, uh, four different DNA tumor viruses, human papillomavirus, polyoma, adeno-5, and Epstein-Barr virus. We carried out yeast-2 hybrid and then also TAP-MS and microarray to investigate the effect of which individual proteins, uh, what their interacting partners were and what effects they had on the transcriptional output of, of cells transfected with those individual proteins. This is a snapshot of the yeast 2 hybrid network, and you have these color-coded by virus, and you see the basic bottom line here was that many host proteins were targeted by more viral proteins than expected, given their degree in the network. There was overlap, but there was also distinct patterns of proteins being targeted by the different viruses. When we looked more precisely at six different types of HPV, we found the following. The two oncogenic Mucosal HPVs shared a very large number of common interactors not seen by any of the other HPV types. All of the HPVs did show some degree of overlap. The mucosal, um, uh, I'm sorry, the cutaneous ones uh, shared some overlap, but that was distinct from the oncogenic mucosal ones. And the low risk distinguished themselves nicely from the high risk, purely at the level of their yeast 2 hybrid protein protein interaction partners. Similarly, when we went back and took all of the genes and, and zoomed in on a single pathway, what we found was that each of the viruses targeted one or more members of the notch pathway. 
So viruses aren't going in and doing one thing. They're doing multiple things, and they're figuring out multiple ways to target a variety of different pathways, in this case centering on uh, just looking at Notch as one example. And one of the targets that we discovered in this process was a gene called mammal. The cutaneous HPVs targeted mammal. And we were really gratified when we found that shortly before ready to submit this paper for publication, one of the TCA, TCGA groups had identified mammal as genetic, uh, as altered in a small fraction of head and neck tumors. So this was very gratifying for us that, in fact, HPV that would give rise to potential head and neck was targeting the same protein that was the subject of genetic variation, reinforcing the notion that these kinds of approaches could be in informative. This is the pattern in transcriptional profiling, and the bottom line here was that viral proteins tended to dysregulate many of the biological hallmarks of cancer. So we integrated all this together and asked the simple question, can we identify potential cancer-causing genes? Excuse me. If we look at all the list of interactors among the various uh, viral proteins in the study, we find several bona fide oncogenes that were found in this and a number of tumor suppressor genes that were found as well, again validating the original hypothesis. More importantly, when we overlapped our results with those of Co Cosmic Classic or the Sanger Somatic Mutation Database, we look at, at Sanger Somatic and Cosmic Classic, there's an overlap of 23. It's a significantly a statistically significant p-value. Our viral targets overlap Cosmic Classic uh, 16, again with a reasonable p-value, and also with the somatic mutation, suggesting that this information here coming out of our studies leads us to potential novel candidates we wouldn't otherwise find through genetic variation. But we're also finding many of the same candidates from genetic variation, potentially validating them as causal in those studies. This, again, just blows it out to all of the various uh, viral proteins interacting back with various human proteins known to play roles in these sets of, of tumors. Lest you think this is restricted to cancer, it's not. We looked at, at flu a couple of years ago and found that the 10 flu proteins, uh, four of which here, targeted a large number of human proteins. More importantly, they targeted a wide range of pathways. And this becomes immediately potential, potential targets for uh, um, uh, therapy uh, in terms of flu treatment, uh, treating flu. Uh, and that work was all really led by Nir uh, uh, Hakoen and Aviv Regev uh, at MGH in the Broad. So I want to lastly turn to uh, the work we're currently doing in systematically studying network perturbations in the remaining couple of minutes. So the, so the challenge is that there's locus heterogeneity. Multiple genes give rise to one disease. The same gene can give rise to multiple diseases. And that we've settled on uh, several terms, which I'll drop on you now. Uh, we consider this change in the network for a given node an edgetype by analogy to genotype and phenotype. That in fact, this particular node has a certain set of reference edges, and when it's perturbed, that collection of changed edges it would be an edgetype, and the concept then is edgetyping analogous to genotyping. Now, lest you think that this is just one more of our tendency to make up words, let me remind you of a number of situations. In the reference situation with a wild type, you have a node and its interactors. You have mutations such as those in APC, truncating mutations, which can lead to complete loss of the protein and therefore loss of all edges. You have more interesting cases such as TP63 in which mutations in the DNA binding domain lead to a loss of a specific interaction. In this case, it's a protein-DNA interaction. You have mutations in the SAM2 domain that lead to a different kind of interaction. And whether you get mutations here or here, you give rise to different diseases. And then lastly, something like RAS where it's a gain-of-function mutation, we would argue that that could potentially lead to gains of interactions. And the best example of those kinds of rearrangements would, could really come from translocations, where a component of a protein uh, now gains interactions by virtue of a translocation. So when we redraw the original diagram I showed you earlier, one can imagine not just knocking out nodes, but also knocking out individual edges, and then what is the outcome of that edge loss? Uh, we think that, there, that part of why we think this is an important strategy to pursue is that in HGMD, uh, 
over half the mutations in protein, co protein coding regions are missense mutations, suggestive of the fact that you might, if you make the protein, you will have altered its spectrum of potential interactions. So our plan is to go and do reference uh, edutyping by first taking the wild type, similarly clone all of the genetic variants we can and push both of those through a screening assay, in this case use two hybrid, but we're not restricted to that, and then asking what's the outcome in terms of the networks that result when you compare wild type or the reference uh, interactions against all of the different alleles associated with genetic variation, some causal, some simply polymorphisms. So for example, we have a pipeline for doing the cloning, we have yeast 2 hybrid as one assay that we can use, and we go and do all the pairwise testing. If this is wild type, you get this set of interactions. One mutation might preserve all of the interactions. One mutation might preserve some but not others, so on and so forth. Those are the terms we assign to them, a pseudo wild type, agetic, or null. And I want to show you two examples of why we think this is a valuable strategy to pursue. In this case, we're looking at the gene TRIM32, mutations of which lead to muscular dystrophy or a completely different disease called bardet beetle syndrome. In the wild type case, we have interactions to three proteins. There's a mutation D487N, which uh, eliminates all of the interactions that we can detect by our assay, and that is severe mus limb girdle muscular dystrophy and its early onset. There's another class of mutations, the R394H, in which some but not all of the interactions are preserved, and that's a less severe late onset disease. And lastly, there is the P130S, in which in this assay these interactions are preserved, and that gives rise to Bardet Beetle syndrome. Now, there could be interactions that are lost because we don't have complete comprehensive coverage of all possible interactions. And of course, there could be some interaction gains here in the P130S that we don't yet know about. But this simple answer, but this simple illustration demonstrates why it's important to understand how each of these different genetic variations leads to a different network circumstance and then hopefully use that information as a predictive tool to distinguish potentially severe mutations from less severe or innocuous ones. This is an example with GRN, granulins lead to frontotemporal dementia, wild type, a whole slew of interactions here. The A9D allele loses all interactions, and that gives us severe FD, and that also leads to Parkinsonism. There are in the literature a number of other mutations in which the overall pathology has not been fully described, and in this particular case we see three examples, one that preserves a number of interactions, one that preserves, loses most, but does preserve one, and one that preserves all of them. And we would argue that by knowing this pattern, we could now begin to predict severity, that in fact the R432C allele would be more severe because it loses more interactions akin to the A9D and the P248L might be not severe at all, or it could be a very late onset disease. So we think that this approach will be valuable going forward as we begin to characterize all the genetic variation coming out of GWAS and other studies. Lest you think that this is restricted to only protein-protein interactions, our platform is to do this, but really we want to also be able to expand it into indirect co-complex membership. We already know that from our work on viruses that the complexes that viral proteins bring down give us more information when, when, when combined with the direct, so we want to do the same thing at the level of genetic variation. Clearly transcription factor binding is going to be crucial here, and in collaboration with Martha Bullock, we're starting to look at both changes in DNA binding sites as well as changes in nucleotide sequence of the encoded trans of transcription factors, and then obviously the ability to execute post-translational modifications could play a role as well. So lastly, I want to summarize by saying that our interest is in really taking the information from genomic variation, using our network models that are coming out of our unbiased screens, knowing full well that our screens are incomplete and that they're static at this point in time, using that combined information to contextualize disease genes and hopefully functionalize causal variants. And with that, I'll again thank all of my colleagues who contributed to this. I just, I have the honor of telling you their story and uh, I'll take questions. Thanks.
Um, that's a very good question. It's, a, it's, an, uh, it's an issue we, we wrestle with constantly. Uh, let me answer it by kind of going around the back side a little bit. The beauty of our yeast to hybrid system, which we've learned over the years, is, it, is that it captures highly transient and potentially very low affinity interactions. Simply because all you need is X and Y to come together long enough to kick polymerase into gear and selection for life is pretty powerful. So we have an assay that will detect those sorts of things and that we can manipulate based on both mass action and affinity. So I showed you the example of two of our different yeast to hybrid systems. One of them uses low copy number vectors, low expression, and, and that's the hairballs that we're showing. We've also used high copy vectors where you get a much higher expression of the protein and we can get more interaction. So in that assay, we can do a little bit of that. But what we really need is high throughput assays, either protein chip, either kind of in reverse transfection assays of the sort that David Sabatini and others have developed over the years, where we could, where we could surgically address that question and look at KDs in the context of intracellular stuff. I'm, I'm telling you a story for yeast to hybrid, but I'm really saying the rest of the world, we need your help in better screening assays, and, and we, once we have those in place, we have the sort of mindset as to how to proceed and get robust data. Yes? Sort of in that vein, how much concern do you have about interactions that cooperatively can capture this response? Do you have to So, um, uh, let me take the second question first. Um, the yeast and hybrid system that we're using expresses all the proteins in the nucleus. If it's, if it's whatever species we're using, if it's done human, we've done plant, so on and so forth. So their, their physical location in their native environment is taken out of the equation altogether. What we're finding is that when we get hybrid positives out, or any two proteins that are in interaction. Oftentimes, when we go back and look at the literature, those two proteins are in that same compartment. But many times, in several cases, we now know that proteins transit from one compartment to another. And we will see their interactors in compartment A. We know it lives in compartment B as well, and we will see those interactors. So, our data set is really designed to give us all possible interactions and not restrict it to based on, on other criteria such as, oh, well, it's, it's, it's a mitochondrially associated protein. How can it ever be in the nucleus? Well, in fact, we're seeing that. We're seeing metabolic enzymes that are playing roles in RNA metabolism. So in that sense, I'm less concerned about is a protein in its right location or are we finding interactions? Uh, your first question was Cooperative. cooperativity. Do the pairwise combinations we're doing now, they're simply binary. But we're really interested in pursuing ways in which we might express a kinase and then put in all of the potential substrates of that kinase and screen that against the entire collection and ask, when we turn on when we turn on the kinase and it phosphorylates its target, how does the target interaction change? Does that make sense? So we can't quite do that. That becomes now a three-dimensional problem. You know, eighteen thousand by eighteen thousand by eighteen thousand. But I think there's ways to do it on selected sets. And and then lastly, a more much more comprehensive effort at doing ATMS would be the other way to start to integrate that. And groups are doing that. There have been a number of papers recently that have looked at several hundred um, human proteins and asked for what are all of the interacting partners. So at some point, we're going to have to integrate that. 